Okay, uh, I guess, you know, if, if some of you have questions on the fourth, fourth question, you can ask me now, I'll, I'll explain things on the board and then you can go back and work on it. Uh, or if you have given up on that question, I totally understand. It's only a 40 marks question, it's not, it's, it's, it's not a whole lot if you, if you lose 40 marks in an assignment. Any question on question number four? Oh, that's a good question. I expect errors of the order of 0 0.01 or 0 0.02. <laughs> Something like that. How, how far is your answer? Like 60. Oh, no, no. <laughs> 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 no, 60 is too much. Uh, yeah, 0 0.012 is fine. Yes, please. That's right. Do you then calculate the next vector of x, k, or do you have to reduce the value of x? So, OK, good point. So you have dk equals to 0, or let me write it in MATLAB notation so you know what I'm doing. Norm of dk less than 1 e minus 3. Then I'm going to check if mu k is greater than or equal to 0, x, k is optimal. Else, AK should be, oh, else, else, uh, J bar, no, not J bar, uh, some, something like A, like ANS, J bar. equals to min mu k. So this will give me the minimum value, which of course is going to be negative. Oh, actually I can move this up. Okay, so here is how I'm going to do things. Uh, okay, well, let it be like this. So I could, so I, I don't care about what the minimum value of mu k is, but I care about the index. And then I will say a k equals to a k, no, a k j bar empty matrix. So this basically removes the j bar L, uh, row of the matrix a k. And then I compute d k equals to blah. And then x k plus 1 equals to x k plus alpha k d k. Only one row of AK. So if, if, if UK is less than zero in multiple You just pick one and you remove that. That was that was given in the class, right? So there exists a J bar for which mu k is less mu k j bar is less than zero. Remove that J bar and proceed. I mean does it make a difference? Uh, it will make a difference because the algorithm says only one. Yeah. Yes, please. So when we when we go in the other part of the end, when dk is uh, not zero, so before this, like it would, it would be it wouldn't be this part. It would be when dk is not zero. Oh yeah. Let me just take a regular step. How do we how do we actually find the set of active constraints at each? Iteration. Do we just do like a times x k equals equals b, and then find the indices where that's true? Not equals equals b, because then you are. Uh, so you know there is numerical error, so it will never be equal equals b. So what you have to do is uh, a k equals to a norm. No, not norm. A b s a x k minus b. less than 1e minus 3 colon. So what this thing does, it looks at the vector axk minus b, uh, the entire vector, and if it is less than 1e minus 3, it means that 
that constraint is active. So that particular uh, row will be true. And then A, so AK will contain all those rows of A where this statement holds true. So this is one line. Of course, the more expanded way, so this requires you to know how MATLAB matrix manipulation works. Now, if you don't know, what you will do is if AJ transpose XK minus BJ. So, so you say AK is an empty matrix if AJ trans, no. For J equals to 1 to 100, if A J star X K minus B J less than 1 E minus 3, A K equals to This is a semicolon. This is a semicolon. And then that's it. End, end. So this is one way to do it, which is you're checking row by row, uh, whether it's an active constraint or not. And this is a one line version of the same code. Yes, please. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, actually, that's right. So you should probably have BK equals to this and uh, yeah, I guess that's how you will do that as well. Maybe this J should be in bracket. Right, and yeah, exactly. So you will have to have BK equals to B of the same thing. And that is actually taking all the rows at once. Right. Okay. Right. I mean, you should check that this is what you, you're getting, like you're getting the right answer. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, this is the way to uh, subsample the matrix where this condition is true. This works in Python. I'm assuming this will also work in MATLAB. Uh, and I think my code contains something along these lines. But definitely check that the AK and BK you are getting is what you actually intend to get after running these codes. I have a strong in, uh, uh, gut feeling that this code is going to work in MATLAB as well. Yes, please. So on the left hand side, that you are removing only one row? Only one row, yes. You can pick any J bar where mu k is negative. All I'm doing is coming up with an easier way to get that J bar by doing the minimization operation. So once I know that mu k is not greater than or equal to zero, then of course I can get this information. Maybe, uh, so I think in MATLAB you can't do element wise greater than or equal to zero. So I guess this particular piece of code has to go up. has to go up and here you only check if answer is greater than or equal to zero. Because if minimum value of mu k is greater than or equal to zero, then it means that mu k itself is greater than or equal to zero. Yeah, I think this one would work better because you can't really check a vector valued, a vector is greater than or equal to zero in MATLAB. Maybe you can. Has anyone tried vector greater than or equal to zero in MATLAB? Oh, all, okay, okay, yeah, you can probably use this all mu k greater than or equal to zero. This is what you were saying, right? Yeah, yeah, probably this would work. Right, all would work, that's right. I forgot about this command. Yes, please. For the initial condition, is there only two elements that are non-zero? That's right, okay. that's right. 
And so at the initial condition, 48 constraints are active. Out of 49, for, uh, no. 49 is the maximum number of constraints that can be active, but 48 constraints are active at the initial point. So A0, A0 would be a 48 cross 49 matrix. Excuse me? Yes? Yeah. Why, why would it go down from 40? Are there 100, not 49? So A is, A is 100 cross 49. Yeah. And this is A0. So at X0, what are the set of active constraints using this expression? Okay, so we get rid of the right. 50 kilo. Right. And then, in that expression, AK plus 1 will be equal to AK, right? And the next operation. AK plus 1, you will just change it to XK plus 1. Oh, and that, and that is still This a. is still A, this is still B, yeah. Any other question? So for every loop of your iteration, I guess every step, you're only at most removing one constraint. That's right. That's right. You're only removing one constraint. Yes, please. So at each step, does your A go back to, does your AK go back to this A? Right, so this, so every time xk plus, xk changes, so you go from xk to xk plus 1, then you have to recompute ak plus 1 using this expression. Yeah. I'm assuming you will have a for loop for k going from 1 to infinity or whatever, and you will be running that iteration, so. So ak or ak plus 1, it, it's not necessarily keep on decreasing. No, there is no reason for you to assume that AK would be decreasing, yeah. I mean decreasing in size. Yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Is there a typical number of iterations that will approach the... You know, it depends on how, what your step size selection rule is, alpha K selection rule, so I can't really say how many iterations it's going to take because it really is strongly dependent on how you are picking alpha K. Uh, if, you if, you took the, if you took a course in linear programming, which typically is taught in the IAC departments, industrial, industrial engineering departments, um, there is actually a very neat way of computing alpha k, which is the, st the step size for linear programming problems. We, of course, didn't cover it in this class, but it's a bit more complicated concept, but there is a very neat way. Once you understand that concept, it's a neat way to go from vertex to vertex, so you don't have to take a like you take a step that is sufficiently long that you go from one vertex to another vertex. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, if when, when D is not equal to zero, um, and then you, let's say, pick an alpha according to our Miller's rule. Right. And then you check the condition where A multiplied by XK plus alpha KDK less right. than or equal to D. And then you keep reducing after you have that's right. Amigos. That's right. So you reduce it by like I'm on So you're point. not so for alpha k, you don't necessarily have to use Armijo's rule, but you have to use something that is like Armijo's rule. So here is how I'm selecting alpha k, and you can select any other way. So I have a positive, I mean I have a non-zero dk and I have xk and I go with alpha naught equals to 10 and beta equals to 0 0.9 or 0 0.95 and I will do if no while 
alpha while a x k minus b has to be less than equal to zero. No, no, no. While a x k plus alpha k, not alpha k, alpha zero Let me put j equals to 0, beta raised to j, tk minus b less than equal to 0. No. Any greater than equal to, no. Any this greater than equal to 0. J equals to J plus one N just Yeah, I think greater than is fine, yeah. That's right. So if any of the elements of this matrix, this vector is greater than zero, I'm going to increase the value of J and I'm going to go back and check again. And then alpha would be equal to alpha naught beta raised to j. Now of course there is a problem that if j becomes 5 or 10 then the value of alpha is very very small so you have to stop it uh, before it goes into an infinite loop. So is it, and then you pick the, this alpha? Then you are, you are pretty much at the vertex. You are very close to the vertex. So if this goes in an infinite loop it means that you are basically standing here. So you're not exactly at the vertex, but you're very close to it. And, and it's okay to go with that alpha. Right, so that's why I added this uh, one e raised to minus three, so that if you are not at the vertex, but you are close to it, this should be able to capture it, and, and you can start moving along this direction from here. Okay. Any other question? Okay. All right, we'll get started with our KKT theorem today. In the previous class, we talked about regularity of a point when you have equality and inequality constraints. So I have minimum of fx such that g of x is less than or equal to 0. And we had mentioned that a point is regular if the gradient of hi and all the gradient of gj's that are active, they form a linearly independent set of vectors. So let's look at a diagram, a figure. So this is my hx equal to zero surface. And on this surface I have g1 x equal to zero and I have g2 x equal to zero and everything here is part of the constraint set. So 
So in this region, G1 of x is less than or equal to 0, and G2 of x is less than or equal to 0. And I'm still on the surface hx equal to 0. Okay. I'll let you guys note it down. So if I'm standing here at this point, x, I have two active constraints. One is h of x equal to 0, of course, and this is my gradient of hx. And then I have another active constraint, which is g1 of x equal to 0. My g2 of x is strictly less than 0. It's inactive. So I don't care about g2 of x. I just care about g1 of x, and I know that the normal to this particular surface, g1 of x, which is coming outside the board, that is this particular uh, vector. And the two vectors are linearly independent. Therefore, this point is a regular point. This x is a regular point. OK? The same thing happens here. I have a vector. This is my gradient of hx. And this would be my gradient of g2 of x. Both of them are linearly independent, and therefore, that's a regular point. So what we have done is extended the notion of regularity, which we studied for the case of constrained optimization problem where, it, where there was only equality constraint. We have extended that concept to the case where there is inequality constraint by splitting the inequality constraints into two parts. One is active constraints and one is inactive constraints. And then we look at only the active constraints, including hx equal to 0 constraints, and we want those gradients to form a linearly independent set of vectors. OK, so now KKD theorem gives us, it extends the Lagrange multiplier theorem to the case with uh, inequality constraints. And the proof actually is similar to the Lagrange multiplier theorem proof, where the, the way you pose this problem as an equality constraint problem is as follows. So this problem is actually equivalent to solving the sol following problem. So this was my original inequality constraint problem. I actually converted it to a equality constraint problem. And then I can go through the entire proof of Lagrange multiplier theorem. And there is only one problem, which is this particular function is non-differentiable. So you have to uh, do a little bit of work to get around that difficulty. But you can otherwise mimic the same steps of Lagrange multiplier theorem, and you come up with KKT theorem, which is necessary conditions for optimality.
Okay. So the theorem is x star is a local minimum and regular if x star is a local minimum and it is regular then there exist Lagrange multipliers lambda star which is an rm and mu star which is an rr such that there's a whole bunch of conditions that are satisfied which i'll write on the other side of the board The first statement is gradient of fx star So the first derivative of the Lagrangian is going to be zero. probably put it in Okay, so these are all the first order necessary conditions for optimality. So let's look at, then I'll go into the second order, but let's understand what the first order says. This term is very similar to what we studied in the Lagrange multiplier theorem. There is gradient of F plus Lagrange multipliers multiplied by the gradient of equality constraints and the Lagrange multiplier mu j star multiplied by the gradient of inequality constraints. So that term is very similar. And it's not surprising because the way you get to this expression is using this particular result, uh, I mean, that particular formulation for the optimization problem. But there are two new things that we see here, which is point number two and point number three. So point number two is saying that my Lagrange multipliers corresponding to the inequality constraint is non-negative for all j, okay? So no matter which j you pick, mu j star is going to be greater than or equal to zero. And the third condition says that if you look at all the constraints that are inactive, so j not in A of x star, so A of x star is the set of active constraints at x star, I'm looking at all the constraints that are not active then the corresponding Lagrange multiplier has to be equal to zero. It has to be equal to zero. There's no other way. And that's an important, uh, it's a very important point, which I will 
touch upon in Monday's class why this is why this is important but but remember that for all the constraints that are not active at x star the corresponding Lagrange multiplier will be equal to zero Any questions so far on these three conditions? Okay. And then let's look at the second order condition, which is D transpose second derivative of the function For all the first order feasible variations, the second uh, D transpose, second derivative D is going to be greater than or equal to zero. We haven't talked about what V of X star looks like in this context. So let me write down the expression for V of X star. D and Rn. This is for all I one to M. Okay, so this is the KKT theorem. It basically tries to apply Lagrange multiplier theorem or at least the proof of Lagrange multiplier theorem on this particular optimization problem. This is equivalent to this optimization problem. So it applies KKT theorem on this, uh, sorry, Lagrange multiplier theorem on this problem which is a completely equality constraint problem. And then it comes up with four sets of conditions that will be satisfied if x star were a local minimum and it's also a regular point. Okay, so we have two sets of Lagrange multipliers here, one corresponding to the equality constraint and one corresponding to the inequality constraints. The first derivative of the Lagrangian is supposed to be zero at the optimal point and Lagrange multiplier pair. Uh, the Lagrange multipliers corresponding to uh, the non-negative, sorry, corresponding to the inequality constraint is supposed to be non-negative. For constraints that are not active, Lagrange multiplier will be equal to zero. And then the second order condition, we have seen it before. Uh, we just have added the mu j star times the second derivative of gj evaluated at x star in this expression. 
for all d in the first order feasible variations at x star, which as you can see, the first term is defined in the same way as we defined earlier. So gradient of hi transpose d has to be equal to zero. In the second term, you will notice that I'm only considering j that are active and I'm ignoring all the j that are inactive at that point. Okay, so that gives me the first order feasible variations. Now let's try to solve a problem for uh, where you have the minimization problem with uh, inequality constraint and see how we can apply KKT theorem to determine an optimal solution. Well, I shouldn't say an optimal solution because so far we haven't talked about sufficient conditions. So let's try to find out candidate optimal solutions by applying KKD theorem to a convex problem. I see everyone has noted everything down, so let me erase this part. So I want to minimize x1 square plus x2 square, oh, I put half here, and let me do 2x3 square, such that x1 plus x2 plus x3 less than or equal to minus 1. What should my step one be? Well, I need to find uh, how many unknowns do I have? So I have three unknowns, x1, x2, x3, and I have the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to this inequality constraint. So I have four unknowns, okay? So I need to write four equations. So that's my step one. I want to write four equations. So remember, this will provide me with three sets of equations. So let me write them down. What's my gradient of f at x? That is x1, x2, and 2x3. What is my gradient of g of x? Oh, as always, I have to write it as less than or equal to zero form. So I'm going to take minus one on the other side and write it as gx less than or equal to zero. Okay. What's the derivative of gx? Just one, one, one. Okay, so at the optimal solution, I should have x1 star plus mu star equal to zero, x2 star plus mu star equals to zero, two x3 star plus mu star equal to zero. Okay, these results come from equation one. Okay, 
So I have three equations, but I have four unknowns. X1, X2, X3, and mu star, I have four unknowns. Now what should I do? Uh, remember, in the other case, we had done h of x equal to zero. That was the fourth equation, and we could solve. But now we don't have the fourth equation, because all I have is gx star is less than or equal to zero. And that doesn't help me, because what should I take gx star to be equal to? I can solve four equations with four unknowns if they are all equality constrained. But if any one of them is inequality, how am I going to solve the system of equations? It's, it's, it's not possible. So then I'm going to use these two, these two uh, conditions to try and identify what value of mu star I should pick. So there are only two possibilities for mu star. Either mu star is strictly positive or mu star is equal to zero, right? So let's consider the easier case where I'm going to pick mu star to be equal to zero. So I have case one. So this is going to step two now. So step two, case one, mu star is equal to zero. What happens if I pick mu star to be equal to zero? Then turns out that x1 star should be zero, x2 star should be zero, and x3 star should be zero. So this would imply that x1 star equals to x2 star equals to x3 star is e they are all equal to zero. So what happens to my g of x star? What is the value of my g of x star? Remember, this is my g of x. This is my g of x. It's 1, right? g of x star is equal to 1, which is strictly greater than 0. But I wanted my constraints to be less than or equal to 0. So we have a problem here. So our hypothesis that mu star is equal to 0 is, is false. So this implies uh, constraint violated implies mu star is strictly positive. So now I have to do step two, case two. Let me do that here. My mu star is strictly positive. Now if mu star is strictly positive, what this would mean is g of x star must be equal to zero. Why should this be the case? Why, is, why am I able to conclude that if mu star is positive, then g of x star should be equal to zero? What is an equivalent statement? So let's look at the contrapositive to that statement. The contrapositive statement says, g of x star is strictly less than or equal to zero implies that mu of star should be equal to zero. That statement is exactly the same as the third statement. Where I'm saying if j is inactive, then mu star must be equal to zero. So if mu star is greater than zero, then it must be that the case that the constraint is active. G of x star is equal to zero. Okay, so that's, that's what I'm using in step two, case two. I'm using the third equality, I mean the third, third, uh, 
statement here, which is what I'm using in step two, case two. Any questions so far? Any questions on step one, step two, case one or case two? No? Everyone understands all the steps. So in case one, we hypothesized that mu star is equal to zero. We came at a contradiction. My g of x star is strictly greater than zero. So it must be the case that mu star is greater than zero. So then I move to case two. If mu star is greater than zero, then it must be the case by number three here, must be the case that g of x star should be equal to zero. So let's uh, write down what that means. G of x star is equal to zero means x1 star plus x2 star plus x3 star plus one is equal to zero. So now I have four equations and four unknowns. I have equation one, two, three, and four. All four of them are equality uh, equal, uh, equations with equality, so I can solve these system of linear equations, and I can compute x1 star, x2 star, x3 star, and mu star. Right? In which statement? Where? Third line. So third line is mu j star is equal to zero for all j that are inactive. So for all inactive constraints, the corresponding Lagrange multiplier should be equal to zero. The opposite statement, the contrapositive statement to this, this statement is, if j is active, then mu j star, no, uh, the, the contrapositive is right here. So if mu star is greater than zero, then it means that g of x star, which is the inequality constraint, must be active. So these two equations, these two statements are equivalent statements. The statement that I've written here and the statement number three, they are equivalent statements. Let me rewrite this third, third statement, okay? If j is not in A x star, then mu j star is equal to zero. Does this make sense? Right, so that's an equivalent statement for the third statement. And here, I'm using the contrapositive of that statement. So if mu star is greater than zero, then g of x star is equal to zero. Yes, please. This one? Yeah, this third one. Oh, uh, right. So the third one, that is, that is also equivalent way of writing it, which is mu j star g j x star is equal to zero. That's also equivalent to this statement for all j. So either mu j star is equal to zero or g j of x star is equal to zero, or both of them can be equal to zero. So this is uh, also another way of writing three, so you can call this three prime, three prime because that's equivalent. And you can call this three double prime because that's also equivalent to number three. Yes, please. Oh, uh, very good question. Anybody else has this burning question right now? I'm going to erase a lot of stuff to answer that question. So anything on this? No? OK, I'm going to erase this. Which side should I erase? Maybe that side should. I should erase this side. OK.
Anyone remembers what the expression for lambda star was? It was limit k goes to infinity k of hxk. This was in the proof of Lagrange multiplier theorem. I, I know you don't remember the proof, but if you go back to your notes, this was the way to compute lambda star. That was the limit. OK, so in the proof of Lagrange multiplier theorem, we actually proved that this limit exists as k goes to infinity. And we named it lambda star. And then the rest of the expressions happened. Now, in this case, in the remember I had mentioned that in this case, my mu star would be limit k goes to infinity right so i had converted the inequality constraint problem to a equality constraint problem yes please the first line, is it lambda star negative sorry the lambda star here yeah that could be negative okay. because h of xk could take positive values or negative values, oh. right? Uh, so that's why this lambda star can be negative. Uh, k is always positive, but h of xk. So this is my h of x equal to 0. And my this could be my h of x 100. This is my h of x 1000, h of 10,000, and so on. OK, so this particular points have negative values. OK, so lambda star could take positive or negative values. Now let's look at mu star. I'm going to erase this part. So g of xk could take positive or negative values, depending on whether you are above that surface or below that surface. But then I'm taking a max. Uh, of g of xk comma 0. Now this term is always non-negative, right? Because if g of xk is negative, the max operator will make it equal to 0. If g of xk is positive, the max of that positive number and 0 will make it a positive number. So this part is always non-negative. I'm multiplying it by a non-negative number. And then I'm taking the limit for a non-negative sequence. I'm going to get a non-negative number. So g can be negative or positive by itself, right? Right. So g of xk is just a number, depending on where xk lies. So this is my g of x equal to 0. and this is my x1, x2, x3, x4. So you could be anywhere above the line or below the line. Or if all of them are below the line. Yeah, it could be the case. Yeah. In which case, mu star will be equal to 0. Because what you're looking at is the limit, not the initial point, but what happens at the limit, right? So you could approach the limit from below. You could approach the limit from above. Or in some directions, you can approach it from below. In other direction, you can approach it from above. So a lot of cases that could happen. So any other question? OK, so what we did in today's class, we understood KKD theorem, uh, which is a necessary conditions for optimality for problems with equality and inequality constraints. We saw through an example, how do you solve uh, for the candidate optimal solution. And it's a bit more complicated than the Lagrange multiplier theorem case. It's, it's slightly more complicated. You have to split the step two into two cases, case one and case two. Now, in the next class, we'll talk about sufficient conditions for optimality. And we'll talk about uh, sensitivity theorem, which is an important concept in optimization. So uh, have a great weekend, and I'll see you guys on Monday.